Hello, my name is Dan Sohm. I'm Principal Scientist at Wyatt Technology Corporation, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, which will be presented by Dr. Ashwin Kumar Burde of FDA CEDAR. And Dr. Burde will be telling us about his work on developing new ways to screen colloidal nanoparticles under conditions which are relevant to preclinical studies in vivo. Uh, looking at the interactions between the nanoparticles and between the nanoparticles and uh, molecules present in the media. And so before we uh, hand it over to Dr. Burdi, uh, I will be providing an introduction to dynamic light scattering. Dynamic light scattering is the experimental technique uh, that Dr. Burdi used. And I'll tell you about the principles of dynamic light scattering as well as something about the instrumentation uh, that he was using as well. So dynamic light scattering is a technique for measuring size of particles in solution or in suspension. It's appropriate for sizes from less than a nanometer and up to several microns. Uh, and it measures the size by utilizing the Brownian motion of the particles in solution. Uh, depending on their size, they will diffuse at different rates. And so by measuring the diffusion coefficient using light scattering, uh, we can determine a dt, the diffusion coefficient, and convert that to a hydrodynamic radius, RH, which is a measurement of size. In dynamic light scattering, we illuminate a solution of particles with a laser beam. And as the beam hits the various particles, uh, some of it will be scattered. It will be scattered in all directions. But we place a detector at a particular angle with respect to the laser beam. And the waves that are scattered off of each of the particles uh, arrives at the detector. Uh, sometimes they arrive in phase, as shown here. Um, and in this condition, there will be what's known as constructive interference and the light in intensity will be higher. But as they uh, move around under Brownian motion, sometimes they'll arrive out of phase as shown here and there we'll see a reduction in light because of destructive interference. So what happens over time is that uh, as we measure the light scattering over time scales of microseconds to milliseconds, we'll see these intensity fluctuations, which essentially look like noise. Um, Fortunately, that noise does contain useful information, uh, which is the rate of diffusion of the particles, and that, of course, is related to their size. So we perform a mathematical analysis called autocorrelation analysis, which gives us the uh, rates of fluctuations present in the light scattering intensity. Uh, and this can be fit to determine a diffusion coefficient, which can then be further converted to size, known as the hydrodynamic radius, using the Stokes-Einstein relationship. The hydrodynamic radius is inversely proportional to diffusion coefficient. And finally, the data can be analyzed to determine the size and distribution of sizes. Uh, so to illustrate the type of distributions that we typically measure in dynamic light scattering, uh, we have here on the top what are known as monomodal distributions. In a monomodal distribution, the size distribution that we get appears to have a single peak, and we can measure its aver average value and polydispersity. If the, uh, if the particles are polydispersed, so in this example, we see that we have monomers, dimers, and trimers, that will e lead to an increase in the width of the peak, and that is presented as polydispersity. If we have a multimodal sample, that means that we have populations with two average sizes, which are very distinct here and here, and each one of them has their own polydispersity as well. So here's an example of uh, three different measurements, measuring a smaller particle, by bovine serum albumin, and you can see that it produces this single peak, so it is uh, monomodal uh, with an average radius of about 3.6 nanometers. Um, a larger particle, so a 50 nan nanometer polystyrene sphere, would produce this blue peak, so it too is uh, monomodal, uh, with an average value of 50 nanometers and some polydispersity, with this, which is the width of the peak. And finally, if we measure a mixture containing both the BSA and the polystyrene spheres, what, which are sufficiently separated in size, we'll see actually the presence of two distributions of sizes uh, centered around each of those particles, each with its own average value and its own width. Um, and DLS is a low resolution method uh, in order for these peaks to be resolved, these, these populations to be resolved in size, they need to differ in size by a factor of at least three to five. So dynamic light scattering can measure size and size distributions covering radii from 0.2 nanometers all the way up to 2.5 microns. Uh, and that's using uh, standard uh, cavette-based dynamic light scattering such as 
the uh, Dynapro what, Nanostar, which Wyatt Technology provides. Uh, you can resolve populations that differ by a factor of three to five in radius. But even if you have a single population, uh, which shifts its radius a little bit due to uh, different conditions, you can measure changes in the average radius down to about 1%. And you can also measure the polydispersity, which is uh, the width of the distribution relative to the average radius. Okay, that's great. And dynamic light scattering is a popular technique and it's well known and is mostly measured in cavettes. Uh, the problem with making measurements in cavettes is that it can be very tedious if you have to measure many samples. So it turns out dynamic light scattering can actually be measured in a micro well plate as well. Uh, in the measurement, uh, we place the samples in a micro well plate similar to the ones those are used for uh, fluorescence or UV measurements. We illuminate from below with the laser and the detector is also placed below. So it measures light, which is uh, scattered back by the molecules in solution, back out the bottom of the plate and reaches the detector. Dynapro DLS Reader 2 is the instrument that uh, Dr. Birdie used in his uh, measurements, and it measures directly in micro well plates. It utilizes industry standard plates, 96, 384, and 1536, the same plates used in other types of um, spectroscopic plate readers. It does have a slightly smaller size range, 0.5 to 1,000 nanometers, and its sensitivity is comparable to that of cavette based DLS, uh, 0.125 mix per mil of a 14 kilodalton protein which is equivalent to 0.0125 mix per mil of a monoclonal antibody at 150 kilodaltons because the sensitivity is inversely proportional to the molecular weight of the molecule. Uh, it can scan a temperature range between 4 and 85 degrees and will also allow you to make measurements of very different samples which have very different levels of uh, scattering because of smaller and larger particles through use of auto attenuation. Uh, and so you can scan an entire 96 well plate in less than an hour the advantages of making uh, measurements with dynamic light scattering is, first of all, it's a non-perturbing technique. Um, the measurements are made in standard micro plates. You can then recover the sample, or you can transfer the plates to another instrument, say a fluorescence detector, in order to make other measurements. Because you can load up the plate with so many samples, it's e easy to uh, make robust measurements, which include controls and buffers and even replicates. Uh, uh, triplicates, quadruplicates, uh, as you like. There's no cross-contamination, so once you've loaded up the plate, there's uh, no uh, pipetting out and back in, there's no transfer or fluid transfer. Everything is done in place. Um, you don't waste time exchanging cavettes or cleaning the optical cell. And uh, using the dynamic software, which is uh, the control software for, the, for this instrument, for the Dynapro plate reader, um, you can uh, view results at a, at a glance in this type of heat map. So you can readily see uh, which samples were appropriate for your measurements, which were out of range, which were aggregated and so forth. Uh, and you can also program a complete multi-temperature protocol, which will ramp temperature, hold, make measurements every hour, however you like, walk away and come back when the results are done and when the measurement is done and you'll see the results before you as we do here. So if you'd like some additional information, I do encourage you to visit the Wyatt website. Wyatt.com slash HDDLS is a nice introduction to the Dynapro Plate Reader. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about dynamic light scattering, we do have additional webinars that do go into more detail than I have today. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ashwin Carberde, who is staff fellow at the US FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Dr. Berde received his PhD in chemistry from the University of Connecticut, where he worked on formulation and characterization of nanoparticle drug delivery to oral cancer tumors and nanotumor, nanotube-based immunosensors for cancer biomarker detection. He's carried out postdoctoral research in the NIH and the FDA on a variety of topics related to the development of nanoparticle and colloidal drug formulations, coll collaborating with other FDA labs as well as outside labs. Currently is studying the stability of therapeutic proteins in the presence of leachables during manufacturing, storage, and handling. Dr. Bertie's work, published in high impact scientific journals, has been cited quite extensively. In this webinar, Dr. Berta will discuss his work using the automated dynamic light scattering plate reader to screen the behavior of colloidal nanoparticles in a variety of media and conditions that are relevant to preclinical studies. On behalf of Wyatt Technology, I would like to thank him for taking the time to prepare and present this webinar. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. Today, 
I will talk about my research work on screening of colloidal nanoparticles under simulated physiological and therapeutic conditions, which I performed in the Office of Biotechnology Products in Cedar FDA. So why colloidal nanoparticles? Colloidal nanoparticles have displayed tremendous potential in the field of biomedical applications. Major biomedical applications of the colloidal nanoparticles such as gold and silver nanoparticles are in the field of drug delivery, diagnostics, cancer therapy, cosmetics, device coatings, etc. To know more about nanoparticles or nanomaterials based submissions to FDA, I would recommend reading the paper titled the Evolving Landscape of Drug Products Containing Nanomaterials in the United States by Dr. Catherine Tyner, published in Nature Nanotechnology. So, why screen size of colloidal nanoparticles? Size is a critical quality attribute in any drug formulation. The size of colloidal nanoparticles can potentially affect both safety and efficacy of the products. Recent in vitro and in vivo studies suggest that the size of colloidal particles is largely responsible for efficient targeting, cellular uptake, transport and accumulation of the particles in cancer cells. Several studies have also shown that agglomeration or aggregation of colloidal particles in biological media leads to immunogenic responses in animals. Hence, one might consider monitoring changes in colloidal particle sizes given that simple size measurements could provide valuable information on the stability and safety of the particles prior to conducting specific safety, potency and efficacy tests in tissue cultures. An ideal size screening method should be based on parameters including relevant media and temperature, uninterrupted or continuous experimental data readout over an appropriate period of time. And a sound sampling plan to ensure production of biologically meaningful size measurements. Here in this project, I have developed a method to screen colloidal nanoparticles under simulated physiological and therapeutic conditions. In this study, I have used gold and silver nanoparticles since these nanoparticles are widely used. A number of published papers have shown that there is an interaction between protein and particle which has an influence on size. Hence, in this project I used BSA bovine serum albumin as a model protein to look at the change in the hydrodynamic size of nanoparticles in presence and absence of BSA. I used BSA because it is a well-studied protein using dynamic light scattering. So why dynamic light scattering? Dynamic light scattering is used by more than 50% of today's pharmaceutical industry to report size. All hydrodynamic size measurements in this project were done using the high throughput plate reader. In order to ensure a sound sampling plan, I tested a total of 18 different particles, pegylated and non-pegylated gold nanoparticles, size ranging from 20 to 100 nanometer in size, as well as pegylated and non-pegylated silver nanoparticles. I tested a total of 10 uncoated nanoparticles and 8 coated nanoparticles. The nanoparticles used in this project were procured from a private vendor. 
The particles were characterized using transmission electron microscope for shape and size. The particles were found to be monodispersed and spherical in shape. Next, the nanoparticles were characterized by dynamic light scattering. Table here shows data for hydrodynamic size of gold nanoparticles measured using Wyatt's Dynapro and Malvern's Zitacizer. Data obtained were comparable for majority of the nanoparticles except for 100 nanometer particles. Now I will talk about the method I developed that mimics preclinical protocol for nanoparticle formulation screening. This slide shows an overview of the high throughput screening assay. The assay consists of four critical stages or steps. The first stage is about sample preparation. Nanoparticles were carefully plated in a 384 well plate. Centrifuging the plate before placing it in the instrument is very important in order to avoid any air bubbles that might have formed. I also wiped the bottom of the plate with alcohol to make sure no dust particles adhered to the plate during the centrifugation step. In the second stage, relevant algorithms designed to measure the stability and aggregation of the nanoparticles through size measurements under defined conditions such as time, temperature and number of repetitions were loaded into the dynamics software. The third stage involved the acquisition of images and size measurements from each well of the plate. The fourth stage consists of analyzing the data collected over defined periods of time. Here data analysis involved both cumulant and regularization methods. The panel on the right side of the figure shows 22 nanoparticle configurations that were tested in BSA medium. After plating the nanoparticles in the 384 well plates, I added parafilm oil on top of it in order to prevent loss of sample. This step is very important if you plan to acquire data over a longer duration of time. Slide shows instrument generated photographs of wells captured on day 1 and on day 5 of nanoparticle size measurement experiment performed at 37 degrees C. This photographic process can help identifying outliers such as air bubbles in the data sets. So along with the autocorrelation function, you can also use this functionality in singling out the outliers. Now I will discuss the algorithm that was designed to test the stability and aggregation of the nanoparticles in BSA medium over a period of 5 days. Here the algorithm assumes that the nanoparticles are used as truck carriers. The algorithm also assumes once the nanoparticles introduced into the disease site will take around 12 hours to completely get internalized into the target cells at the physiological temperature of 37 degrees C. The algorithm also assumes the nanoparticle delivers the drug over a period of 5 days. Hydrodynamic size data of the nanoparticles were first collected at time 0, then every 12 hour time point. Here is the hydrodynamic size data for BSA under the 5 day experiment. Histogram of BSA indicated that BSA was stable for 5 days at 37 degrees C. 
the autocorrelation data indicated that the experimental run was smooth without any high background noise. Here is the hydrodynamic size data for gold and silver nanoparticles presented in the form of heat map. The autocorrelation data not shown here looked similar to BSA without background noise. Uncoated nanoparticles in water did not show any increase in hydrodynamic size, while the same particles in BSA containing media showed an increase in hydrodynamic size. In contrast, the pegylated particles did not show any increase in size be it in water or BSA media. Most particles remained stable except for silver nanoparticles which are known to be less stable compared to gold particles. 8 out of 10 uncoated particles showed similar pattern while 7 out of 8 pegylated nanoparticles showed similar pattern in terms of hydrodynamic size change. Polydispersity index can be an important measure of how heterogeneous a sample is. Polydispersity index data shown here indicates that media has an impact on the hydrodynamic size measurements. Nanoparticles in BSA containing media showed higher polydispersity index compared to the same nanoparticles in water. This data indicates that polydispersity index can be used as one of the factors to evaluate sample quality. Overall, the data obtained indicated that BSA association varies with nanoparticle size. For example, a 10 nanometer particle had a single layer of BSA associated with it. A 20, 40 or 60 nanometer particle had 1 to 2 layers of BSA association while a 100 nanometer particle had 1 to 4 layers of BSA associated at a given time point. Earlier studies by various groups have indicated that BSA gets adsorbed onto negatively charged nanoparticle surface through electrostatic interactions. We believe different levels of surface charge on the colloidal nanoparticles had an influence on the levels of BSA association with the particles. Though there was BSA association with uncoated particles, pegylated colloidal nanoparticles did not show any noticeable association with BSA. In summary, algorithm based high throughput screening of protein particle interactions helped in pattern recognition and in obtaining data in days that would take years using conventional QAID based approach. Hence, dynamic light scattering is a good survey method for size analysis. In this study, four parameters were studied, size, coating, composition and media that are known to influence particle size. 28,000 data points were collected. Out of 10 uncoated or non-pegylated particles, 8 showed similar pattern in terms of association with BSA, 
while 7 out of 8 pegylated particles showed similar pattern in terms of association with BSA. So, what did we learn? Uncertainty of protein association increases with size. As you saw, a 10 nanometer particle had one layer of BSA associated while a 100 nanometer particle had one to four layers of BSA associated at a given time point. BSA seems to stabilize nanoparticle because I looked at the size changes over a period of 90 hours and they were stable. I did not talk about one more algorithm that I used which is a temperature fluctuation algorithm where I used therapeutic temperatures shifting from physiological temperature of 37 degree C to 60 degree C and back to physiological temperature. Even under those conditions the hydrodynamic size did not change drastically. And of course, pegylation helps in avoiding protein association. So, what are its implications on drug development? For targeted drugs, I believe smaller size better for high targeting efficacy because of less protein crowding happening. If a certain size is a must, then pegylation can help in protein corona problem. And in this project, I saw that gold particles were more stable compared to silver nanoparticles, hence composition also matters and needs to be looked at case by case basis. These are some of the important references related to today's talk. The most important ones are in bold. I am thankful to Dr. Serge Bokaj who allowed me to conduct this project in his laboratory. I also thank my collaborators from NIH and research colleagues at FDA for all the support and guidance without which this work would not have been possible. I also thank Stephanie who helped me with the algorithms and I thank Dan for helping me prepare this presentation. Currently, I am evaluating the stability of therapeutic proteins in the presence of leachables during manufacturing, storage and handling in the laboratory of Dr. Kurt Brorson. Finally, I would like to say Dynamic light scattering has a lot of potential beyond just simply measuring size. I believe by modulating time, temperature and duration under the framework of an algorithm driven approach, one can evaluate the drug formulations for in use stability, accelerated storage conditions as well as force degradation conditions. This approach can help save time, money, critical reagents and overall experimental duration. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me at my given email address. Thank you for attending this presentation.